Hello and welcome to this special on bestsellers and blockbusters. The heavy artillery of the publishing world, those books which always appear in the front of the shops, which tend to bring on the sniff from the critics. I mean, when did you last read a kind review of Dan Brown? But which sell in their millions and bring huge pleasure to many readers. Tonight, we've called in four of the very biggest guns to explore both the art and the business of the bestseller, their own and others. The marketers might call them name brands. Their publishers, to adapt the old joke, would probably stick with sir, or in one case, madam. Uh, so without any further ado, let's meet them. Di Morrissey. Madame Morrissey is the author of 17 best-selling novels, including The Valley, Monsoon, and most recently, The Silent Country. Lee Child is the man behind the enigmatic Jack Reacher. His wildly successful series of books, which began with The Killing Floor, is now up to number 14, with the recent release of 61 Hours. Matthew Riley, well... Action is his middle name. He set the pace with Ice Station and has been keeping readers on the edge of their seats ever since. His latest is The Five Greatest Warriors. While Bryce Courtney is quite simply this country's biggest selling, best known author. From The Power of One and Jessica to Last Christmas, the story of Danny Dunn. Won't you please welcome them all. <laughs> best sellers. Let's start with the one that shouldn't have been the bestseller, the one that came out of nowhere, because we all think we know the ingredients and people say there's a format, blah, blah, blah. Who saw the Millennium Trilogy coming out? Stieg Larsson's book, it, it should have it, written by non-English author, Swedish translation, author's dead, couldn't be sold, um, no one had ever heard of them, swept the world. Who picked it? Well, I'll tell you who didn't, and that was his publisher, because I well remember I was at BEA, which is Book Expo America, two, three years ago, and the publisher of that book is a guy called Sonny Mehta, very famous in the business, mm -hmm. and he cornered me on, on the floor and pressed a copy of that first proof into my hand and said, please, please read this and give it some kind of comment. We, we can't do anything with it. And so, this is Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Yes, it was. So I did read it, and I have a blurb on, on it. But then what happened was that X factor, you said ingredients, and there's always one extra ingredient. And it was, it was to do with him being dead, I think, that it became a human interest. <laughs> it was a human interest story. He's a career aspiration. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And it's doing so well. I said to my, my own publicist in the States, I said, please don't include being dead in your promotion <laughs> plan. <laughs> It is, people do say it is the perfect author, yeah. where you Jenny, I, dead author. I'm reminded of the fact that I was in New York and I was handed this manuscript in much the same way as Lee has just said and said, what do you think? And I read it and I said, well, it's not a bad synopsis. It might make a good book. And it was called <laughs> The Madison of... The Bridges of Madison mm. County. Oh. Yeah. I think it's sold 14 <laughs> million or something. Yeah. Is that right? So, you, yeah. so even... Highly attuned bestseller brains. You can't always pick it. That's the whole paradox because there is no formula. And I don't think any of us here yeah. write to a formula. And, and maybe that's disappointing for uh, prospective authors. They think if they could just crack the code, then they're, they're away. And I, and I think with, with uh, Stieg Larsson's that, that it, yes, it touches on genres and yes, it, that there's, there's certain things in there, but because it doesn't have a formula and it, and it yeah. is so unusual and the, the way he did it and the subjects it touches on, uh, because you know, it was originally called uh, Men Who Hate Women, mm. wasn't it? Uh, that, that, that can make it work. And I think the same thing applies to like movies. You think, I'm going to make a movie to crack the American market, so we'll put in a big American star, do this, do that, and then it doesn't work. But if it really comes from, uh, I really think if, if You've got to come from inside and then you've, you know. <clears throat> Definitely, it's got to. It's got to come from the heart. And, and, and the Stig Larsson books are good. There's no question they about They are good, them. but they're, they're complicated. Good yeah, they're good, complicated books, but then Scandinavian crime fiction usually is. But they're no better <laughs> than previous Scandinavian crime fiction. I mean, I started reading that stuff in the, in the 70s. There, were, there was a married couple, Marge Stowal and Per Walu, who, in my opinion, are the best. 
And really, we haven't moved on from that. Henning Mankell was no better than that. Stig Larsson is no better than that. But there's always an X factor behind a huge success. And it was that kind of human interest story about... Oh, the author being dead. The author and the girlfriend not getting the money, the money and, and the... Um, that whole thing that just tips it over the edge and starts people talking about it. But isn't that called storytelling? Well, yeah, no. it is. But, and we're it's, all nosy, we're all gossipy, we all want to hear the news and we all want to be told something we didn't know. Exactly, and, and it, we, de we depend on that one extra factor to take it. It would have done fine, that book would have done very well, but the, it, the fact that it's done so well is because of that extra bit. And I suppose that's what a gigantic bestseller needs, is the extra bit. The extra bit. But is that about the, the author? Like Bryce, you're saying we want to know that, that extra bit, but, but then that's kind of putting us in the, the firing line and not letting the work stand on its own because, as we all know, marketing is such a huge part of it. But does, is it necessary that people know stuff about us? No, it's, but it's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all know that. Personalities help sell books. And as all these guys will tell you, I mean, it is an endless treadmill uh, promotion. And it does sell books. There's no doubt it sells books. Well, what I found is that every single thing sells books. Everything you do sells books. The question is, is it economically effective? Um, I mean, I once met a fan who had all the books, wanted all the books signed, and I, sometimes I ask them, do you remember why you picked up this book? And she said, I saw you at a conference and you opened a door for somebody and I thought, what a polite gentleman, I'll try his book. <laughs> Every single thing works. And if, if, I'm, if I meet a, a, a first-time author, a newly published author, and they say, what is the one thing you can tell me? I actually tell them two things. I say, write what you are passionate about, the kind of book you yourself would like to read. And the other thing I say is, do every bit of publicity that you can. If you can get on television, fantastic. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you get an interview with your local newspaper, do it. Because if you don't get on the radio, get into the local newspaper, then your book is on the shelf and it's at the mercy of browsers. You need to be able mercy to... Mercy of browsers? You're at the mercy of browsers. And if you want to be at the mercy of browsers, you'll sell 15 copies. And if you get on the radio and you say, I've written this new book, it's called Pink Flowers, people go to the bookstore and say, oh, I heard this young bloke on the radio, he's this book mm. called Flowers or Pink Something. And the bookstore goes, oh, yeah, that's Matthew Riley, Pink Flower. That's my new title, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's You've very always, exciting. You always said, I mean, you actually give away books, don't you? Well, you know, people come well, up to I you. I agree with you, you, you take every opportunity, you take every politeness um, that you can, because, because you can be insulted too. Well, you, you've got to draw the line somewhere. This year, I didn't. I became Barrel's Tulip Queen. Now, that's going too far. <laughs> that really is going too far. You're joking. No, yeah, no, it's not joking. I was the Tulip Queen for Barrel, you know? And they said I was the best queen they'd had. <laughs> um, but, but yes, I, I, for instance, get stopped quite a lot um, in supermarkets and inconvenient places and... and so you always stop and you always have a chat and you're always polite. Mm. Um, but, but I do something extra each time, and that is <laughs> I say to them, I'm glad you enjoyed the book, give me your name and address and I'll send you my latest signed. And so I probably give away 2,500 books a year. Mm. Now, now, I know a lot of people, a lot of authors, simply can't afford to do that. They just can't afford to give them away. But That's I their whole print run. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but when you think about it, and, and uh, it, 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 you may see it as a, as a gesture of, of generosity, but on the other hand, they're going to tell 20 or 30 mm. people mm. that, that they nice man who sent the book from book. you and they met you in the street. Um, so you. That's what you, I mean about the, that's, extra, the extra thing. You've extrapolated uh, that. Yeah, yeah, you know, not only is it a good book, but the, the reader likes you. And then they do talk about you. Instead mm. of talking about you to 10 of their friends, they'll talk to you about 20 of the of And your, uh, word friends. of mouth is the most potent, don't you think? Mm. Well, there's, a, there's another yes. thing too. It, it, it's a personal pronoun. He's my mm. author. I like his books. They're my kind of books. Mm -hmm. That's the fix. Mm. And, and, and I don't think it's a secret. I think you work very hard to get there. I mean, extraordinarily hard. I do want I mean, to ask though, is there much competition? I mean, we, if you are in the bestseller biz, how important is it to be number one? Mm. You're not one. I think it's pretty important. 
I think kind of it's, nice. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, to be honest, it's forced on us because there are bestseller lists and they are ranked from one to ten, and you are put on it somewhere. And if 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 it's going to be a list, then why not be number one? <laughs> well, you know? I read somewhere that you'd actually you have dreamed that you had a nightmare that this book, which is at number three, had sunk to number twelve. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It, and I'm not a competitive person, and I do not believe that writing is a competitive sport. It's not the Olympic Games. It, but there is something about that list that is compulsive. And, um, I, you know, if I'm going to be on the list, I want to be high on the list. And if I'm going to be high, I want to be at the very top. Because <laughs> why not? Isn't that your nature? I mean, nobody, if somebody comes up to you and says, well, you're a, you're a definite number two, mate, you think... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have something to say about when Matthew says it's about being close to your audience, there is a closer position in, in, in writing, to me anyway, and whether it's true for anybody else, I don't know. And I call it the fourth protagonist. I believe that, that I didn't say this, I think Dostoevsky did, certainly Isaac Bashevis Singer did, and that was that there are three major protagonists in any book. Two very important and one they play off. And no matter where you go, you can have 20 or 30 or 40, there'll be three major ones. I contend there are four. And the fourth is the reader. When the reader picks up Matthew Riley's book, put it on camera, it's not a book yet, but the moment they start to read, it becomes a book. It's nothing before that. It's, it's a pound and a half of paper. This is an example, I think, of one of the fundamental differences, I would suggest to you, between literary and popular writers. You all believe, I understand, I mean, you, you've actually done on, on record as saying, but a book only becomes a book when a reader is engaged. Of course. Yeah, mm. I absolutely, is that can be right? Yeah, yeah I totally mm. agree with what Bryce says. First it's written, then it's read, then it exists. Mm. The reader is 50% of the deal. The reader creates the mm. book just as much as the writer does. Yeah. Otherwise it is. It's just mm. some, some wood pulp. It's the reader that makes it into a book by consuming it. And uh, we, have to, we have to be very clear about that. The reader Do you agree? Do you agree? Absolutely. How many yeah, times have, have, has the reader come up to you and said, you know that incident where, and they'll name your name character and say, where she did this and this and this, is, I thought that was fantastic. And you go, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't write that. She wrote it. Yeah, that happens all the time. It's a 50-50 thing in that, in that there's, a, I always imagine that, uh, there's this just this bond. There's, it goes from my hands into the hands of the reader and there's this kind of invisible thread be and that connection between you and me and no one else. And that's what's really special because when you meet people, they then feel that, you know, they've, they've shared that experience. And but I, w I want to pursue this idea of a book not existing because surely many, many literary novelists would say, no, no, the book is the... And I want the reader to like it, but the book is the thing. I've it's made the effect. this book. It's the the effect and the emotion and the the. Sure, the, but that's like masturbation. It's nice, but yeah. <laughs> you know, she, it's that, <laughs> come on. It's that old Zen thing, you know. If the tree falls in the forest, or my version of it, if a man speaks in a forest and his wife is not there to hear him, is he still wrong? <laughs> And it's the same thing with the book. If it's, if it's written but not read, it doesn't exist. It, yeah. um, I really believe that. And that, is a, that would be, wouldn't you agree, a fundamental difference between a popular writer like yourself and a literary writer who would say, even if it, no one reads it... But, but, but that's I, a pretext that I, I can't even grasp. I can't even actually get my head around the fact that I'm going to write something that is there to please me and has no consequence, and if somebody else picks it up, well, that's fine, and if I get the money, I'll keep it. Mm. Look, this thing, this, this lovely book, has got 37 hours of average reading, entertainment in it. Mm. 37 hours for what? If you go to you get a special on it, 28 bucks. Mm. Now, now that's going to two movies, you've got 37 hours of entertainment in this. This is a and salesman <laughs> extraordinaire. <laughs> and, and, this, and, and, and this book, uh, which... I constantly have fans come to signings and say they read the book in one sitting and they read it in a day or two days. It took me 13 months yeah, to, to refine and refine that book uh, to make it as fast as humanly possible for someone to read. And it's doing one more revision to make the book that little bit faster, mm. that little bit faster, which is what makes this a 37-hour read. And to my mind, the notion that... I, I don't like the literary versus popular debate... I, I think it, it was around before I was here and it'll be around long after and it's an argument that can never be won. 
But what I do object to is somebody saying that the time I spend making this as fluid and fast and readable as possible uh, is some sort of inferior form of writing. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is. You yeah. churn them out. If one reviewer or interviewer says to me again, oh, she's churned out another one, here she is yeah. again. Oh, and, it's and just like I've, I've sprayed it on the paper well, like hairspray. Yeah. And they have no concept of the blood, sweat and tears and the refining and the redrafting that late hours. Yeah, that Matthew's do. point is another difference between literary and what we do, which is that in, in popular fiction, we do the work mm. and the That's reader right. enjoys the ride. And literary people seem to think that the reader should do an awful lot of the work to try and puzzle it out and figure it out. And we don't believe that. And actually, in my books, every word is polished, but it's for the point of that the reader doesn't have to puzzle over it. The reader just goes, yes. get, the reader gets in the car, I'm driving the car, and the reader doesn't have to do the work. Yeah. I agree completely. Yeah, so right. that's, a, that's a complete distinction, isn't it? So that you I don't, it so it's not your fault as a reader if you don't enjoy the book. No, and I think that's something that we, we have to come out and say. You know, we, you can't blame the reader if, the, if they're not enjoying the book. That's our fault. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe popular writers are the only ones that admit that. Yeah. Well, how do you deal with literary snobbery? Ignore it. I mean, the, the figures speak for themselves. Readers must like what I'm doing. How so often do your books get reviewed? In the beginning, not often. Uh, then there's always sort of a middle uh, space where I couldn't be ignored. And now they're sometimes reviewed and sometimes not. And I really, I really don't, don't worry. There's no proper criticism in this country, really. I've had reviewers who have enjoyed the books. I've had reviewers who've hated the books. I've had reviewers call me racist. I've had one book reviewer say that Scarecrow uh, had less literary merit than a shopping docket. Um, <laughs> But, oh, we've all had that. But, but <laughs> part of the success as well is developing some emotional armour. You can't please everybody and you can't expect to please everybody. There is a fellow who wrote me an email and he said he'd like to see me lowered, hands first, into a wood chipping machine so I can never type my drivel again. <laughs> he was a bit disturbed, but... <laughs> this, it's, sometimes if you're going to have your name in large silver letters on the cover of the book, you're going to have to deal with that too. Yeah, I get reviewed and I've, I've gone through three phases. First of all, ignored. Second of all, sniffed at. And I've been persistent about challenge, challenging them. And I now get, they finally had to come out and admit, yeah, they're enjoying them and they're quite well written. Because I take the fight to them. Because mostly my reviews are in Britain. American reviews are very ghettoized. You know, they're in the thriller section. And they're perfectly fair because they're talking about what they're talking about. But the, the snobbish reviews are usually in Britain, and I carry the fight to them. I How mean, do you last do week, that, Lee? What do you do? Do you well, ring them up, write to them? No, I mean, you know, there's usually media coverage. Journalists will come. And, and last week I was in Britain, and Ian McHugh and Sola came out the same day. So there was this kind of um, grudge match thing going on, 61 Hours by Lee Child versus Sola by Ian McEwan. You know, the good guy versus the bad guy. The, the smart guy versus the thug. And... Um, I was asked about it constantly in interviews, and I made the point, and I think this is a serious point, actually, that the rivalry does not come from us. Why would I care about Ian McEwan? Yeah. It comes from... <laughs> it, it, right! <laughs> it, the rivalry comes from them. That was well said. And it, was not a, it, and it is not necessarily about the sales. It is not necessarily mm. about the sales. It's about something else. It's about this, that they know in their heart that we could write their books, but they cannot write our yeah. books. That's what it's idea. about. And, and all and they try. Yeah. And they have yeah. tried. Under other names. And, and they sometimes say, yeah. oh, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to. And I say, well, why wouldn't you? You could set yourself up for life. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, in the paper in Britain last week, I deliberately said, I was trying to start a fight about it. I said, oh, I could write a Martin Amis book. It would take me about three weeks. It would sell 3,000 copies Good like man. he sells. <laughs> and... <laughs> Good. Only because I'm with the same publisher as Ian McEwan, so I didn't really want to pick on him particularly. <laughs> but, and, and that's what it is. Yeah. They, they know they can't do what we do, and they are jealous of, of that skill. Do you... But that absolutely assumes that they do want to do what you do. Well, who wouldn't? I mean, come on, if you could... 
if you could, if you were a, a literary author starving in a garret and you had to, to, to turn out a Bryce Courtney and make yourself a multi-millionaire so your family was, was looked after forever, why wouldn't you do that if you could do that? Of because course you would. Because I think some people feel so powerfully about their art um, that they wouldn't. But maybe I'm wrong. I think you are wrong. I think okay. that if well, you... Well, yeah. OK, you're 2% right. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, yeah. I've met it. I, I was at a writers' festival once on a panel for thriller writers and there was a poet who had written a thriller and they asked him, why did you write a thriller? And he said, well, I saw those thriller writers were making money so I thought I'd, you know, develop an international intrigue story, put some sex, put a car chase in it, have someone get killed. The book disappeared without a trace. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. goes all the way back to what we were talking about at the start. It's harder than you think. He had no passion for it. Thriller readers spotted him as a fake in 10 seconds. Just as poetry readers, if you saw the Matthew Riley book of poetry, yeah. poetry <laughs> readers would spot me as a fake. Yeah. No. I'm, I'm, Although, I, I'm I love waiting that. For, that was very good. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm waiting for uh, Ian McEwan's next book. It's going to have a little quote on the bottom saying, what do I care about Ian McEwan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you, marketing. Everyone talks about marketing. How important is it? And what does it mean for a bestseller? What do you have to do? Uh, well, marketing is different from promotion. Marketing is a, is a technical thing about inserting your book into the physical outlets. Um, it's about bidding to get your book front and centre in the store, in the drugstore, in the supermarket, in the airport. It's a, it's a technical thing, and that is absolutely essential. Because at the end of the day, we talk about books, people love books, but the, va the vast majority of the population is ignorant of books. They don't know a thing about it. They, they, they vaguely heard of something and they immediately forget it. But if they're in the airport and they walk past that little rack of books and, and there's a title there that chimes in with their memory, then they go, oh yeah, and they pick it up and they buy it. But if it's not in the airport rack or if it's not in the front of the bookstore or if it's not in the supermarket, then they don't have that opportunity and it dies. So it's presence. You're saying you've got to have presence in the racks. You've got to be Distribution, up there. yeah. Penetration of, of the market. Distribution is, is in my opinion, 99% of the game. I think in terms of marketing, all of our books that you have here on your table, we each have our name in the exact same text on each book. That is branding mm -hmm. and that is marketing. And if you see a Bryce Courtney book, in hardback, it's Bryce's true. name will always be written like that, my name will always be written like that, Lee's will always be in the capitals, Dyer's are the same. And that is, when you go to a bookstore and you see the name Di Morrissey, you say, this is going to give me a good story. Yeah, and you, that's, yes. that's marketing. Yeah, you say, Bryce, that you don't even like gold embossing. Well, I have to tell you that every time, I shamefacedly say this, we take 20 covers and they're researched. In, in discussion groups and every time I say this time the first question is can he get rid of that gold writing on the page and every single time the first answer is never get rid of the gold writing on the page mm -hmm. because it's an identity it's something people feel comfortable with they feel ah oh, he's come up with a new book Lee Charles as Matthew has right. Di Morris's new book is out Matthew only gets silver though <laughs> Not the game for gold. <laughs> yeah. Des describe the classic Jack Reacher cover. Well, this is the classic one. I mean, this is a, a style that we've we've evolved over the, the last several years. Normally, it has a moving vehicle, though. Well, there is. There's a moving vehicle. There's a lone figure. The lone figure represents Jack Reacher, obviously. And even if you don't know the series, you look at this, and it is the gold writing implies what what they've just been saying. It implies a certain thing. The lone figure, okay, this is a story about a lone, tough guy, self-reliant, he's going to solve the problem. And then the rest of the picture is some kind of representation of the story. And this one is, is cold, it's set during a snowstorm. And here's some kind of mysterious plane about to land. And so some kind of private space is going to be invaded by, by, by an outside force. This is absolutely... And I'm, it has been worked on, it has been tested, it has been discussed endlessly. They spend an awful lot of time because this, this is it. This is a nine inch by six inch advertisement for my brand. And this is all there is effectively. And, and, and it, covers are absolutely mm. crucial. Absolutely now, Lee, crucial. if I said that in Australia, I would get into the deepest kind of doo-doo. Yeah. Why is that? Because I'm commercialising it again. There I am, ad man, background. He doesn't, he can't write, but boy, can he sell. Yeah. Mm. And do you resent that? Not anymore. I used well, to. The, the, but you used to. 
This should sum it up, actually. He can write and he can sell. I mean, and that's, that's what it's about. That's mm. what it's about. Mm. Mm. These authors here, they can write and, boy, can they sell. Lee, can I ask you, when you came up with the name Lee Child, did you plan that because it fits so well on the cover? See, Morrissey's such a long name. It's <laughs> pain. I'll tell you, seriously, absolutely. I chose Child because it is easy to hear, easy to say. It's also a, a word as well as a name that produces normally warm connotations in people because people usually like children. And it begins with the letter C, which is early in the alphabet, which is excellent You're for browsing. <laughs> I started the out, of browsers. I started out writing in, in 1994. It was actually when I first started the first book. And in, in, the, in the middle 90s, 63% of, of bestsellers began with the letter C, like Mr. Courtney here. It was, that, is, that was a provable statistic because we browse from left to right, we get fatigued very early, and by the time you're up to sort of F or G, you're sort of bored with it. So you've got to be there. It's true. It's absolutely fascinating. And we could talk all night. A huge thank you to Di Morrissey, to Lee Child, to Matthew Riley, and to Bryce Courtney. Until we meet on the first Tuesday of next month, very happy reading from every level of the shelf. Good night to you.